Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to again peer into your word and pray that you would bless us. I thank you for each and every brother that's here, for what they represent, um, the fact that their souls have been purchased by your son's blood, Father, makes them so precious. And I pray, Father, you would just encourage us tonight, please help your servant articulate the truth in a way that's understandable and would bless your people. I ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1. We're continuing our study on um, kind of a, a survey of the Gospels, but especially appreciating the Son of God in the way that the Father has represented him to us in the four Gospel accounts, the four accounts of the evangelists. And so we left off with this um, overview in the last session, and now we'll be looking at the Gospel of Matthew. Thank you. One of the first questions uh, to ask is, why is Matthew first in the canonized scripture? And obviously that's not particularly uh, inspired by the word of God, by the, the Spirit of God, but I think there is good reasons why Matthew is the first of the four gospel accounts. The first uh, chapter of Matthew, we, we have these genealogies. Actually, I think I'll do some reading here. I'm not going to read all these names, but I'll just highlight in chapter 1, verse 1, the book of the genealogies of Jesus Christ. Now mark this, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Um, what we're going to be looking at tonight is so wonderfully going to dovetail into what Mercer was teaching us. I was just kind of amazed as I was listening to this session. I thought, well, this is like greasing the skids. So uh, we're going to be looking at this term, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And so then we have these, this genealogy that's taking us from Abraham to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we have Isaac and Jacob in verse 2 and Judah, and it goes on down uh, through the genealogies, of Boaz, Jesse, and then we get to David. And then we have David, Solomon, Rehoboam, um, Abijah, Jehoshaphat, Jehoram, Uzziah, going right through the kings of Judah. Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, Manasseh, and we have Ammon. Then from uh, Josiah, we have actually Jehoiakim, whose name is not mentioned, and Jeconiah, or Jehoashin. And then we have the last kings all the way to uh, when the southern kingdom fell, Zedekiah would be the last of the kings. And we go through... Uh, Verse 15, Ezra. Go to verse 16, Jacob. You got Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who was called Christ. So it's not a complete genealogy that we have in Matthew. There are some gaps and holes in it. And I'll explain why that is in just a moment. But we have the son of David, key phrase in, in Matthew's gospel account, and the son of Abraham. And so the genealogy is taking us from Abraham to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the reason we have the genealogy here in Matthew is to show the fact that Jesus Christ has a legitimate claim to the throne of David. He's a descendant of David. So why is Matthew first? If you're familiar with the Hebrew Bible, there's 25 books in the Hebrew Bible. It's the same as our Old Testament. But first and second Chronicles, first and second Kings, and so forth, first and second Samuel are just Samuel, Chronicles, and Kings. And then the minor prophets are all one book called the Minor Prophets. All right, so that takes you from 39 to 25 books. The last book in the Hebrew Bible is Chronicles. All right. When you're doing your read-through through the Bible, which I know you all are doing that at least once a year, right? When you're coming through and doing your read-through and you come to 1 Chronicles chapter 1, what's the tendency? Skip it. 
Just skip it. Eight, uh, eight chapters of genealogies, almost nine chapters. And it's like, oh, I can make up three days in my read-through if I skip all these genealogies. Don't tell me you've never thought of it, all right? <laughs> There's some good stuff in there. Prayer of Jabez, a few other things. We find that sons of Korah became singers in the temple. I mean, some, there's some bright spots, but it's, it's heavy genealogies. And so in the Hebrew Bible, you have all these genealogies coming up from, from Adam, basically, to 400 years before Jesus Christ comes. And so there's this gap, there's this silence. Um, as God's covenant people um, are under discipline, they're being under the Gentile rule, they're being oppressed and so forth, waiting for the Messiah to come. So Matthew picks right up with the last genealogy, and chronicles and takes it right to the Lord Jesus Christ. So, um, the Matthew connects the Old Testament uh, messianic promises with New Testament fulfillment after 400 years of uh, silence. And we have genealogies both in Matthew's gospel account and in Luke's gospel account that Luke has a different reason that's there. Again, Matthew is presenting the credentials of Jesus Christ being a legitimate heir to the throne of David. He's a descendant of, of David. Um, and so it says, and Jacob was, Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Well, Joseph was through Solomon, David's son, and a legitimate heir, but there's a little problem. And that is in verse 11, Josiah begot uh, Jeconiah. And this is Jehoiachin, Jehoiakim's son. Jehoiakim rejected the word of God. And so Jeremiah, uh, God speaking to Jeremiah, puts a curse on his son Jeconiah, or Jehoiachin. And we know Jehoiachin was hauled off to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar, and that's where he died. No royal lineage from Jehoiachin. And so Messiah could not come from Jehoiachim, so there had to be another way to still satisfy the, the claim to be a descendant of David, and yet not come under the, um, the curse on, that God placed on Jeconiah. Well, Mary was also of the tribe of Judah, and Mary came through not Solomon, but through Nathan. And so she would be... Um, the Holy Spirit would come upon her. She would conceive the incarnate Son of God and bear him. She was also a descendant of Judah. And so in this <coughs> gospel account, we have the genealogies all the way back to Adam, uh, to the Lord Jesus, through Mary, and that shows his human lineage. And that's why we have genealogies in both Matthew and Luke's account, one showing his uh, royal lineage, to the throne of David, uh, the, the fulfillment, the promise, and in Luke's gospel account, the human linkage. So, um, Matthew begins by completing the Messianic uh, genealogies. I believe that's why it's the first gospel that's mentioned. It's Jewish in favor, uh, flavor. I mentioned this. The, he's, Matthew's constantly going back to the Old Testament prophecies and showing how they're fulfilled by the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, be born of a virgin, be born in Bethlehem, uh, go to Egypt for a time. He would be raised in Nazareth. A lot of those uh, early prophecies Matthew brings out. Uh, this kingship is stressed throughout Matthew, and so some of the parables, like the, the wedding feast parable, if you read Luke's account, it'll say a certain man, but in Matthew's account, we read a certain king. And so it's the same parable, but again, the writers are holding up their vantage point of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew uh, presenting Christ as the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies, the legitimate heir to the throne of David. Luke holding up the humanity of Christ. Mark, that he's the lowly servant of Jehovah. And John, his, his deity. Now, looking at verse 1, it says, The book of genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. Now, who is first, David or Abraham? Abraham, like a millennial, a millennium ahead of David. But yet, Matthew's focus is the son of David. And you'll find that phrase ten times in Matthew's gospel count, only five other times in the other three gospels. So, it's the son of David. 
And so Matthew's saying, this is the promised one. This is the Messiah. This is the descendant of David who's going to sit on the, the throne forever. And in some cases, the people understood that because he was speaking as one with authority. He would do miracles. And they would say, could this be the son of David? And so Matthew brings into that, that Jewish flavor that this Jesus Christ really is the Messiah, the promised Messiah. So the son of David, and then it speaks of the son of Abraham. The son of Abraham, as we heard in the last session, the promises to Abraham are a lot wider than the promises to uh, the son of David. So Abraham, all nations of the earth will be blessed through Abraham. Read that in Genesis chapter 12, which Mercer was talking about. And so uh, right now, the, the kingdom was offered. We read that in Matthew chapter 4. From that time forth, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He was offering a, little, a literal, earthly, political kingdom. It was a legitimate offer. And so then we go on through Matthew, we see that it's offered, offered, and then it's rejected. The Lord starts talking about going to the cross. And now we have the, the, uh, the kingdom in, in the spiritual state that's on earth. But there's a coming day, as Mercer was telling us, that the literal earthly political kingdom will come again. God's going to keep every promise he's made to the nation of Israel. And we are... Uh, second benefactors to that new covenant that God made with Israel. Our brother was talking about the first covenant was to show them they couldn't keep the law. They needed a savior. Paul says that in Romans chapter 3 verse 20. Um, By the law comes the knowledge of sin. To show you need to repent. You need to understand that you need a savior. And the second covenant, which the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel all foretold, uh, we see that new covenant Hebrews 8.8 8 was made with the house of Judah and the house of Israel. Okay? God, that's where the covenant's made for. That's where he's going to keep his promises. But we as Gentiles become the second benefactor of that covenant and come into all those blessings. That's how all nations of the earth will be blessed through Abraham. He gives us that model in Genesis 15.6. Abraham believed God and was counted to him for righteousness. I was talking with Mercer about that. That's the first time in Scripture you find those three words together. And actually, it's the first time you find them in Scripture. Believe, count it, and righteous. That's how God's going to save all the way through the human timeline. He represents this truth, an economy of truth. And when we take it by faith, then he imputes righteousness to our account. And without being justified in Christ, we can't get to heaven. It doesn't matter where you are in the timeline. That's how God's going to save what we have to uh, show faith in is, is different. Uh, different truths are revealed to us, but that's how God is going to accomplish it. Right? So we have the son of Abraham. That's a wider encompassing thing. The son of David is just Jewish in nature, uh, the coming Messiah. And I think that's why uh, Matthew puts him first before the son of Abraham. So Matthew is very dispensational in uh, content. And I find, uh, so I've been appreciating Mercer's teaching on the, the kingdom and so forth. So many of the passages in the Old Testament and New Testament, if, if we look at them, they clearly have dispensational teaching. Um, Moses goes up the mount seven times. And I believe every time he goes up the mount, there is an association with the seven major dispensations. That's why after the golden calf incident, when you get to uh, Exodus 33, it's the highest concentration of grace in the Old Testament. That's the sixth trip that Moses makes up the mouth, the sixth dispensation of grace. The seventh dispensation is, happens when Moses is stuck in the, uh, the cleft, and he says, I want to see your glory. God says, you can't see my glory and live. But I'll stick you in the cleft and you can look at my afterburn, <laughs> you know, my afterglow. And so God allows Moses to see his, his aftershine or after glory. And that's the only time then that Moses comes down the mount and his face is glowing. 
The space didn't glow the other times. The seventh time he comes down. What's the seventh dispensation? The kingdom age. And the glory of God's going to fill all the earth. Amen. So you, it, you, when you see these things over and over in Scripture, it's like, fantastic, isn't it? So um, anyway, we got one of these clear... Um, in Matthew, we have a phrase that divides the book into three portions. We have this, for that time, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's in Matthew 4, 17. So up till that time, we have the genealogies, we have the birth of Christ, and so forth. But after he is baptized, he receives the uh, anointing of the Holy Spirit, he, his ministry's kicked off. And the first thing he says is, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's offering a little earthly political kingdom. He's telling his disciples, just go to the lost sheep of Israel. Don't go to the Gentiles. That's where the message of the kingdom was to be preached. But in Matthew 16, right around the transfiguration of the Lord, for the first time, he starts talking about his death. He's going to have to go to Jerusalem. And he's going to be put to death. He'll, he'll raise the third third day. And so we see Israel rejecting. They wanted uh, relief from the Roman Empire, but they didn't want the spiritual aspects of repentance and humbling, humbling before God to go along with that. And so they didn't receive the Messiah. They didn't receive the Messiah on the Messiah's terms. And so the kingdom is, is pulled back. And this was God's plan all along. Uh, the Lord would go to the cross. But there's a coming day when the kingdom gospel, read this in Matthew 24, will be preached throughout all the earth, right? When the church is in heaven, uh, there's 144,000 evangelists, Jewish evangelists, according to Revelation chapter 7, and the, the kingdom gospel will be preached in all the earth again. Then it'll be received. And uh, the last two verses of Ezekiel uh, 39, not one Jew will be left anywhere in the world. They will all be brought, brought back to Israel, the land of Israel. God, as Mercer said, he's promised them a land. And that each tribe gets some different allotments. We read that in the last part of Ezekiel. That's never happened. There's a millennial uh, temple. It's never been built. It never happened. God has to fulfill those promises uh, in his word. So from that time forth, very dispensational um, we can see the kingdom being offered. We can see the kingdom being rejected. Uh, we can see then the offer going, come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, kind of this invitation to, to anyone. And the Lord speaks of his, his death, burial, and resurrection. Matthew has a lot a, of miracles, and there's a reason for that. The Jews wanted to see signs. And Peter, in Acts chapter 2, his first message after the, the coming of the Holy Spirit, the church has been created. Uh, his first message is he's talking to his um, countryman, his Jewish brother, and he says, Jesus Christ approved you by signs, wonders, and miracles. The Lord did lots of wonders and miracles. And that was, um, Paul also references that to the in chapter 1 of his first epistle to the saints that Corinth as well. The Jews, they required a sign to believe. Um, my cop will understand this, but Missouri in the United States is called the show me state. You know, they won't believe it unless you show me. Well, that's the way the Jews were. They, they're the show me people. you got to show me um, to, in order to believe. And so the Lord did. And that's why Matthew has so many miracles recorded in it. And Peter's first message then also aligns with um, under, validating the fact that Christ was approved of them by signs, wonders, and miracles. So when John the, the baptizer doubted, uh, Christ said to his disciples, go and show John again. Again, tell him what you're seeing, that the blind see and uh, the deaf hear and so forth. Validate the miracles as proof to John that I am the Messiah. So some unique features in Matthew's gospel we've already been thinking about. Uh, Mercer had us look at Daniel chapter 2, where there that stone cut without human hands that smites the image of Nebuchadnezzar. 
again, this blueprint of all Gentile rules uh, in the feet. And then once all the debris is blown away, that, un, that stone of uncut hand, speaking of its divine nature, grows up to a, a big mountain, speaking of a kingdom. Uh, Micah 4.1, another example of where a mountain is used metaphorically to speak of a mountain. <coughs> Revelation 17, 9 through 10. In my book on um, Bible numbers and symbols, I go through about 25 symbols. If you understand how God consistently uses symbols in Scripture, the book of Revelation unfolds. John starts in chapter 1. He says, the revelation came from the Father, comes to the, to the Lord, to the angel, to John, and to us, and that the Lord is signifying. The word there is symbolizing the content. That's a little different than most of the other prophets. Most of the time, the Lord would just take the vocal cords of the prophet and, and declare his word. But for John, he's showing it to, the Lord is showing John all this revelation like on a big screen TV, and John's trying to, to write it down and describe it the best he can. And so if we understand that this is symbolic representation and we under, understand the way God uses symbols throughout Scripture, then it's like a key to understanding what the meaning of revelation is. So, for example, Revelation 17 talks about, uh, it's talking about Satan and the seven kingdoms that he's had control of. That's why the, um, the dragon has seven heads. And John relates that to seven mountains. And he says, these are five kingdoms that have come, one that is, and one shall be. And so that's one of the strongest uh, connections, uh, the allegorical connection between a mountain and a kingdom or authority. Well, the Egyptian, the Assyrian, the Babylonian, the Medes and the Perds, Persians and the Greeks had come and gone. That's your five mountains that have come and gone. Rome was in power at the time. And then the, you would have the revived Roman Empire that would come uh, when the Antichrist would come to rule. And he would have ten kings for a moment. And so those are the seven mountains representing also the seven heads on the dragon. It's in Revelation chapter 12. So mountains are very uh, key in Matthew's gospel. We see a uh, mountain on the Sermon on the Mount, which is the manifesto of the kingdom. Uh, the Lord goes up to a mountain to pray, was transfigured on a mountain. By the way, I, I believe the transfiguration of the Lord, this is my opinion, happened at night. Luke's gospel said they came down the next day. Can you imagine in the, the darkness uh, north of Israel and the Lord being transformed and the glory of the Lord shining from a mountaintop at night? How incredible that must have been. It says they came down the next day. Um, all of it discourse, Matthew 24 through 25. He uh, takes his, his disciples up on the all of it and gives them that, um, that dissertation of things to come. And then we have the, the closing of Matthew, the Galilee Commission, which happened on a mount. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, another thing in Matthew is... Fourteen times we read the Lord saying, I say unto you, very authoritatively. Again, he's, he's the king speaking of his kingdom, and show, he's showing his authority. And at the conclusion of his sermon, we read, this was uh, the Sermon on the Mount, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. One having authority. Could this be the son of David? See, these are the things that Matthew's bringing out. It's, it's a Jewish perspective uh, showing the Old Testament prophecies that Jesus Christ is fulfilling them one after another. He is the son of David. He is the promised Messiah. Other unique features. In Matthew's gospel, we have the Lord commanding angels. For example, Matthew 13, 41 uh, the Lord commands his angels to go out and uh, gather the tares for the fire, for the final judgment. 
In Matthew uh, 24, 30, I'm trying to remember what that one is. That's, oh yeah, that's another uh, gathering the angels um, together up uh, those for judgment. Thank you, Mike. And then the last one is Matthew 26, and this is where he says, all I have to do is ask my father. He sent 12 legion of angels. Mm -hmm. So again, Matthew's the only one who brings this out, that the Lord is the one who's commanding the angels. He's controlling it. Luke, for example, will record an angel ministering to the Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane. You know, that's showing his human uh, aspects. He's in toil. He's in anguish. He knows what's coming. He sweats, as it were, as great drops of blood. Um, and so Luke brings that out, but Matthew's bringing out the fact he commands the angels. Uh, ten times the Lord Jesus receives worship in Matthew's gospel account. When you look at the other gospels, only once in each of the three. Again, he is royalty. He is to be revered. He is the son of David. So, for example, in some of the miracles, when you are uh, comparing them, let's just look at Matthew 12, 22. It's a good example of this. Then one was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. Now, Luke records something very similar to this, and that's where he stops, but not Matthew. All the multitude were amazed and said, could this be the son of David? See, that's Matthew's perspective. He's bringing this out. Yes, he is the son of David. And so they were understanding what doing these miracles meant. Could this be Messiah, the anointed one? Could this be the son of David, the promised Messiah, and Matthew's bringing that, that out. Focus on specific ministry to the lost house of Israel. So in Matthew 10, the Lord sends disciples out two different times, two by two in groups. If you think, uh, if I pull down my imaginary map here of Israel, okay, and so here's Galilee, here's Samaria, and here's Judea. The Lord spends about two years here in Galilee, and then he goes over to Decapolis, and he's there for about six months, and then he goes down to Judah for about five months, and after the Feast of Dedication, he goes over to Perea for about four months, and then he comes back for the final week. So if you can remember the number two, that really shows you the three plus year ministry of the Lord, where he was at. About two years here, six months, four or five months here, about four months in Korea. In Matthew chapter six, when they are still in Galilee, he sends his disciples out two by two, the 12 disciples. Later, when he's down in Judea, he sends 70 out. Okay? And he tells them, only go to the lost house of Israel. The kingdom message, I'm offering this to my Jewish brothers, fulfilling prophecy. Again, he's offering a literal, earthly, political kingdom. The kingdom gospel message. And so, um, in Luke uh, 15, 22, actually, let's take a look at this as well. I want to show you something that I think is, again, astounding. And this just shows the dispensational truth. It's being brought out, especially by Matthew. Matthew 15, 22. Now this is, um, the Lord only did two miracles with Gentiles. This three and a half year period that he's uh, on the earth, he's, he's going to lost sheep of Israel, but there, he made two ex uh, ex exceptions. The Syrian, um, sorry, not the Syrian, the centurion, totally different people. Uh, the centurion servant was healed at a distance. And then we have this story. Jesus went out from there, departed from the region of Tyre and Sidon. So the Lord has gone all the way north for a specific reason. And behold, a woman, a Canaanite, came, 
sorry, woman of Cana came from the region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. See, he's here's a Gentile appealing to the son of David, recognizing who he is. My daughter is severely demon possessed. But he answered her not a word. Can you imagine that? Here's a here's a mother saying, My my daughter is demon possessed. Have mercy on, and she's begging, and the Lord doesn't even answer. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. In other words, she was relentless. She wanted mercy. And she's pleading with the son of David. Whenever there is someone pleading for mercy, genuinely pleading, God answers that prayer. But he answered and said, I was not sent except the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread, speaking of the Jews, and throw it to the little dogs, speaking of the Gentiles. That's not a very polite way of addressing a woman, right? You're a dog. Why would I want to give the bread to the dogs? And she said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Wow. This woman understood the big picture. And the Lord answered. I don't know if the Lord said, wow, but that's kind of the thing that was going through his mind. Oh, woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. She understood Yes, you've come to the lost sheep of Israel. The promises of God are, are to the Jewish people. But all families of the earth will be blessed through Abraham. And when there's someone pleading for mercy and, and acknowledging the Lord for who he is, um, I don't know of anywhere in Scripture where that, that prayer is an answer. That's the heart of God to show mercy and grace. And so here we have the second miracle done, only two for Gentiles, both done at a distance. Why? Because the Lord came to the lost sheep of Israel. He didn't come to, to the Gentiles. Uh, there would be an opportunity for the Gentiles to come to him during the church age, but he was coming, presenting a literal, literal earthly political kingdom. So when we go back in the Old Testament and we're thinking of that scene when Naaman comes to visit, visit Elisha, um, you know, the testimony of this little girl who had been caught up in human trafficking, and she's a Jewish girl taken to Syria, and she says, oh, my master would only visit the prophet in Israel, he would be healed of his leprosy. And this little girl had such a believable testimony, uh, such a sincere heart, compassion, that uh, Naaman's wife hears it, tells Naaman, Naaman tells the king of Syria, and before long, the king of Syria writes a letter, sends gold and silver with his servant to the king of Israel, and says, heal my servant. We've heard about this this uh, prophet and the king of Israel tears his garment. Who am I to heal somewhat from leprosy? I can't do that. He's picking a fight with me. Elisha hears it. Says, you send Naaman to me. Naaman comes down to a, Elisha's place, knocks on the door, and Elisha says, Gehazi, go tell him to bathe seven times in the Jordan River and his, his flesh will be made clean. And you remember when Gehazi told Naaman what to do. He was furious. Not only did he have a problem with leprosy, but he had a problem with pride. Jordan was probably only four miles away. Elijah was probably with the, the sons of the prophets in Jericho. And thankfully, uh, his servants talked into wisdom and, and he went down. But here's the point. Elijah's ministry represents the ministry of the Lord Jesus. Elijah, the ministry of John the Baptist. Elijah is calling down fire from heaven. He's doing public displays, calling a, a, a pagan people, his countrymen, that are deep in idolatry, back to the Lord. Um, it was a confrontational ministry. But Elisha, he's a champion of the people, and he's working with the people one-on-one, -on -one, the meeting needs, just like the Lord Jesus did. So here you have the only person healed of leprosy in the Old Testament, a Gentile, Again, done at a distance. Beautiful dispensational truth. A God is holding these things um, consistent all the way through Scripture. All 
All right, some other unique features. Um, only Matthew refers to the church, the ecclesia, ek, uh, preposition to be called out. Uh, the root word is kleo, and it's plural. So you have this called out company. That's literally what the church means. But notice it's only after Israel's rejection that we have the church mentioned in the gospel account and only in Matthew, twice, Matthew 16, 18, and also Matthew 18, 17. Uh, the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24 and 25 is unique. Much of that is unique to Matthew's account. I love Matthew 24. It steps through chronologically. Uh, that whole discussion starts out by, tell us of your coming, right? The disciples want to know what's coming up. And so the Lord lays this out beautifully. You've got signs of the coming of the tribulation, the signs in the first half of the tribulation. You have the abomination of desolation. Then you have the great tribulation and signs associated with that. You have the sign of the Lord's coming. And then you have the judgment of nations. It's all laid out chronological in order in Matthew 24. And then some of the parables and so forth that go along and support that just further explain what God is going to accomplish. Again, very dispensational. One of the really interesting things in Matthew's gospel is the, the use of two. Under, when Moses was up on the mount and God was giving him uh, the law, how many witnesses was necessary to prosecute someone successfully? Two or more, right? Two or three, but a minimum of two. And so the number two permeates Matthew. He brings this out over and over again because under the law, you had to have two witnesses. And again, he's, he's speaking to a Jewish audience. So in Matthew 8, 28, we have two possessed with demons. Uh, Matthew 9, 27 and Matthew 20, verse 30, we have two blind men. Actually, I want to look at this Matthew 20 for a minute and show you how far Matthew goes to record this detail that the other writers do not call record. This is Matthew 20, verse 29. Now, as they went out of Jericho, a great multitude followed him. And behold, two blind men sitting by the road. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. Well, we've seen that before, haven't we? Then the multitude warned them that they should be quiet, but they cried out all the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. So Jesus stood still and called them and said, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Lord, that our eyes might be opened. So Jesus had compassion and touched their eyes. And immediately their eyes received sight and they followed him. Now, when you look at the, the parallel account in Luke 18, What's the name of the blind man who came and got his sight? Bartimaeus. Luke doesn't record two blind men, neither does Mark, but Matthew does. There's two that were healed that day. Um, but this is Bartimaeus. Um, Bar, son, unclean, son of the unclean. Um, that, that's what his name means. And he became, he gained his sight that day because he cried out for mercy to the son of of David. Again, the, mess, the Messiah, the one promised uh, from David's uh, loins. <laughs> now, there's so much floating through my head on this. Um, Matthew chapter 22. This is Super Tuesday. It's just a few days before the Lord would be crucified. It was this big day. Um, not only does he tell a, a lot of parables this particular day, but the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the Rhodians and the lawyers, everybody took their shots at the Lord Jesus, trying to trip him up, trying to ask questions they didn't believe anyone could answer. And he defeats them over and over and over again with wisdom. And finally, they're kind of like, 
Uh, we're not going to say anything anymore. We're not going to ask him any questions. So the Lord says, I got a question for you. Verse 41, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they said to him, the son of David. They answered correctly, didn't they? He said to them, how then does David in the spirit, in other words, inspired by God, call him Lord, saying, the Lord, speaking of the Father, said to my Lord, that's the Son, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? And they couldn't answer. They knew what he was saying. That the son of David, the promised Messiah, had to be both God and man. That's the only way that that would work. They answered right, the son of David, but they didn't want to believe that the son of David was standing before them, the God man. And from here on, we see that they are working overtime to crucify the one that God had sent to him, the embodiment of truth, both the message and the messenger. Um, one more thing, and this is not on the chart. Look uh, with me in Matthew 4. This is what's called the temptation of Christ. So after his baptism, after he receives anointing of the Holy Spirit, he goes off in the wilderness, and um, he's fasting for 40 days. And what we have here is the grand finale of, uh, of the devil's tempting or the trying of Christ. I think it's Mark's gospel tells us that, that uh, the enemy was was after the Lord the entire 40 days. What we have here is just the grand finale of his attack on the Lord. So notice that in Matthew chapter 4, this is verse 1, that Jesus was led up the spirit in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and nights after he words he was hungry, now when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up. By the way, that's a misquotation of Psalm 91. Whenever the devil quotes scripture, he always changes it, and he distorts the psalm here. It says, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And then verse 7, Jesus said unto him, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And again, the devil took him up to an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory and said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. So when we read this account of Matthew's gospel, he talks about the devil uh, tempting the Lord to turn these stones into bread because he's hungry. And then he talks about taking up to the pinnacle of the temple. He says, Cast yourself down. Uh, the angels give charge over you. They're going to protect you no matter what you do, which is this quotation of Psalm 91. And then he takes them up to a high mountain. Mountains represent kingdoms. And he shows them all the kingdoms of the world. And as Mersh has already pointed out, the kingdom was lost in Eden. So he is the prince and power of the air. He is the, the God, the little g of this age. And so it was a legitimate offer that he was making to the Lord, but it was not in God's will for Lord Jesus to respond to it, receiving the kingdom that way. It's a satanic device. If you read the account on Luke, you'll find that the first thing that the devil says is turn these stones into bread. You're hungry. Then he goes up to the mountain, offers the kingdom, and then he goes to the temple. And so skeptics, when they read the two accounts, they would say, see, the word of God doesn't agree with itself. Here's a clear contradiction in Scripture. Not at all. We have to remember that each writer is presenting the Lord Jesus from their vantage point. 
Luke is presenting the situation in chronological order. Matthew is presenting the situation from an escalation of authority. And the whole idea here is that the Lord would have changed those stones into bread. He would have had to bend down before the devil to pick them up. And that's what the devil wanted. If he would have cast himself off the temple, he would have been below the devil. And that's what the devil wanted. And then at the end, he doesn't even hide it. He says, you just bow down to me, I'll give you all these kingdoms. I was explaining this to an 11-year-old I have in the study. He says, man, the devil's tricky. <laughs> he is. And so he was defeated at the cross. Mercer's already been telling, Mike's been telling us about that. Um, his sentence is decreed. The Lord said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all these men unto me, and then the prince of this world will be cast down. He's defeated. All he can do now is cast doubt on the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all he can do. Deception. Um, causing us to move off the bedrock of truth. So again, there's not a disagreement between the gospel writers. They're just giving their perspective of the Lord. Okay, final thought, and then we'll open it up for some comments, and then we'll pray. Uh, no ascension in Matthew's gospel account. No ascension in John's account either. Matthew comes up to the crescendo. He has... The Lord on a mountain, he has his subjects before him on the mountain. Again, the mountain represents the kingdom. This may have been what Paul refers to in 1 Corinthians 15 when he had above 500 brethren. Uh, it might have been this mountain in Galilee where the Lord's presenting himself. And so we have the king on his mountain in his kingdom, the subjects of the kingdom before him, and Matthew brings his curtain down. That's the climax of his presentation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why there's no ascension in Matthew's gospel. Again, there's not disagreements between the writers. They're, uh, again, focusing on uh, their theme and presenting Christ from that, that vantage point. All right, so we'll, we'll pause there. Just have any comments, questions, anything you want to add, and then we'll, we'll pray.